This is part three in our series on being a good steward. Where are we so far <laughs> in understanding this concept of being a good steward? Well, turn with me to 1 Peter 4, verses 10 through 11. This is kind of our foundational scripture. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. Peter writes, As each one of us has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Peter suggests our fundamental approach to the Christian life. The process starts by God giving us a grace, a free gift. A free gift by definition means something that we could never earn or deserve. And then we empty ourselves of ourselves so that we can be true bondservants. A bondservant has no interests outside of pleasing their master. We steward each and every gift, every grace that God gives us, and we do the job of a steward in such a way that God gets all the glory. Implied in the role of a Christian steward is an understanding that we in ourselves are not capable of doing this job. So we accomplish this assignment of a good steward by letting Jesus live his life in and through us. That's the his strength part. Jesus becomes the wisdom, the strength, the capability that we need so that we can be truly good stewards of all of God's graces to us. We talked last time about God's gift of family, family relationships, and how we might recognize family as our assignment of stewardship. Today we're going to talk about stewarding the grace of ministry. Our relationship with Jesus might come up and, you know, that's a grace too, right? It's a free gift, this relationship we have with Jesus. Maybe we can start in on money. Let's see. First, I want to make something clear. There's a modern misconception going about about grace. Uh, many Christians today have a warped view of God's grace. To them, God's grace means that God's lenient toward us. To them, it means that God doesn't really care what we do wrong in our life because His grace will just lead Him to forgive and forget whatever we've done. And so under that logic, as a Christian, I'm free to do whatever I want to. And I never have to worry about the consequences. I never have to worry about any discipline or chastening from God. Sometimes this philosophy is called hyper-grace. Like every other lie of the enemy, there's a grain of truth in that distorted worldview. The truth is that God will always forgive us of any and everything if we repent and ask for forgiveness. And the truth is that God's grace is indeed what provides that forgiveness. But this philosophy misses a couple of really important points about God and His grace. And let me share them with you. Number one, because of God's great love for us and His desire for us to have an abundant life, all of God's laws are designed for our benefit, for our best. When we break God's laws, when we sin, we're actually working against our own best self-interest. The hyper-grace folks essentially say that God's grace gives you the okay to sin. Well, why in the world would I want to sin if that's not my best? The second thing they miss is that as a Christian, I have been redeemed. That means that I've been bought and paid for. I no longer own myself. I don't have any rights over myself. I belong to God. And since I volunteered for this position of slavery to God, I'm what's called a bondservant. A bondservant owns nothing and has no interests apart from his master. I've emptied myself of myself. I've invited Jesus to come live his life in and through me. 
Again, I have to ask the question, under these circumstances, why would I ever want to go against my master and sin? Well, the third point they miss is that God pours out His grace, His free gifts on us, to demonstrate His great wisdom and love, and He expects to get all the glory for each and every grace. As His bondservant, He's given me the lifetime assignment to steward and to be a caretaker of each and every gift of grace that He gives me. And He expects me to fulfill that assignment, not in my own strength or capability, but through the wisdom, the strength, the capability of Jesus living in me. If God pours out His grace on me so that I can steward that grace and bring glory to God, then I have to ask the question of those hyper-grace folks, how in the world does my uncontrolled sin bring glory to God? How does me taking advantage of God's forbearance and sinning all I want to, how does that show that I've been a good steward of God's grace? So obviously, in this series, we're not talking about hyper-grace. We're talking about a Bible principle that Peter summed up so well in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. God gives us gifts for us to steward to God's glory. That's the summary. Do you see how antithetical hyper grace is to 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11? Well, anyway, let's talk about stewarding the grace of a ministry, okay? How many times have you heard a Christian say something about their ministry? Well, my ministry is all about this or that. I wonder how the Apostle Paul felt about his ministry. Turn with me to Acts 20 and verse 24. Let's see if we can get a clue here. Acts 20 and 24, Paul says, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God, the good news of God's grace. Paul described what he did for others as a ministry that had been given to him by the Lord. When God gives you something, that's a grace to us. Based on Paul's life, when he was called Saul, Paul certainly did nothing to earn or deserve this ministry. It was a gracious gift from God. Technically, it wasn't Paul's ministry. It was God's ministry. Paul was just the earthly steward of that ministry. Paul actually uses the term steward when he talks about his ministry to the Colossians. Turn to Colossians 1.25. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Colossians 1, verse 25. Paul says, Of this church... I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry the word of God. Paul was a steward of a ministry to the Colossians. This ministry was tasked with carrying the word of God to the Colossians. Whatever ministries God has given me to steward, I have to consistently remember that these ministries are not mine. They don't belong to me. They're God's ministries. That's He's tasked me to oversee and manage these ministries for Him. We normally think of a ministry as something that's de desirable, something good, right? We think of the gifts of God as being wonderful things. And then our job as steward of those gifts is a great pleasure. Well, Paul seems to have a slightly different take on the gift of a ministry. Turn to 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 17. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, For if I preach the gospel, I don't have anything to boast about, for I'm under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For, in other words, if I don't carry out my ministry, for if I do this voluntarily, I'd have a reward. But if it's against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. Paul was given an assignment to carry out the preaching of the gospel. In verse 17, Paul acknowledges that this is a gift 
You know, it's a grace because he says that it's something that he can't boast in. It's clear here that Paul was under great compulsion to properly steward this ministry that God had given him. Paul was driven to make sure that the ministry was done right. God's ministry was done right. I can tell you that I've been placed in situations in ministry that just weren't any fun. Almost all of the ministry I do is very fulfilling to me. But sometimes situations and people can be difficult, to say the least. Sometimes you get blindsided or even betrayed in ministry. Sometimes you're facing a difficult decision and it seems like Jesus living in you has quit talking to you. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. I think that we can learn an important lesson about stewardship from Paul's experience. Some graces, some gifts from God are entirely pleasant and good. My forgiveness is that way. Man, it's a wonderful thing without reservation. But sometimes God's gifts to us come with a mixed bag. It's a job that God needs doing here on earth, and He chooses us to do that job to be His steward. But that job may come with some suffering on our part. Well, that's okay. As a bondservant, I've emptied myself of myself, and I'm ready to do whatever he calls me to do. This assignment that Jesus had on earth (laughs) certainly included some suffering, didn't it? So don't conflate the idea that if it's a gift from God, it has to be entirely pleasant and fun. Like I mentioned last time about the alcoholic father, maybe God gave you the gift of that particular family so that you could be a gift to your family. In your love, in your intercessions for your family, that sort of thing. Back to Paul being a good steward over the ministry that God gave him. How did Paul handle the times in ministry that were not so pleasant? I mean, Paul got beaten more than once. He got shipwrecked, among other things. One time they he was beaten so bad they left him for dead. Turn to Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13, tells how Paul dealt with things. He said, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. And this is the secret. I can do all things in Him who strengthens me. Paul had learned the secret of being content in every circumstance. What was that secret? Well, Paul describes it in a mistranslated verse 13. If you were reading along with me as I was reading, you probably read, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. But that's not what it says. If you look at the underlying Greek words, it is completely clear that this passage can only be correctly translated as I can do all things in Him who strengthens me. I think Peter shared Paul's approach to ministry too. Turn to 1 Peter 5 and 2. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2 reads, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Peter is saying, steward your flock, not out of compulsion for greedy gain. Peter's talking primarily here to pastors, but this advice, I think, applies to all ministries. If I'm in this for my own gain or for my own promotion, You know, I'm actually working against God, not for Him. Let me tell you a story about a pastor who is fleecing his flock, okay? We knew a pastor. We knew that somehow he was taking money out of the church that he shouldn't have. I don't know if it was embezzlement or not, but he was taking too much money out of the congregation. On a woman's retreat, Debbie gave a word of prophecy to the wife of this pastor And she told her that if her husband didn't stop fleecing the sheep, God was going to take the ministry away from him. Well, if we're just God's steward of the ministry that he gives us, 
then saying that God would remove us from that ministry is perfectly in line with God's prerogative as the master, right? Well, I had a chance to work with this guy, and I found him to be quite stubborn. He was going to do things his way no matter what anybody else said. He just refused to listen. He was stiff-necked, as the Old Testament would say. And he died in a fiery plane crash that took his, him, his wife, and four other people and because he was doing something on that trip that I'd warned him not to do. We need to examine our motives very carefully. God's not willing to share his glory with anyone. We need to make sure that we understand the structure here. God's God, and I'm not God. I'm just an emptied out steward. Personally, I think we make a mistake when we name a ministry after a person. You know, John Smith Ministries, Jane White Ministries. That draws attention away from God and toward the person. Listen, that ministry that you steward, it's not your ministry. It's never going to be your ministry. It's God's ministry. God's gift to you and to others. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 through 13. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 through 13. Paul writes, Now I exhort you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I've been informed concerning you, my brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of the Anointed One. Has the Anointed One been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul abhors the kind of division that was based on people and their names. I know that in the modern world, our ministries need names and they need a legal organization, okay? Name your ministry God Loves You or Grace for All or Sunrise or something, but don't name the ministry after you or any other human. When we do that, we miss the point. This is God's ministry, not mine. I'm just the steward. So God gives us a ministry to steward or operate on behalf of God. He gives us all the resources and wisdom that we need to do that ministry. He expects us to dedicate ourselves to this ministry. <laughs> but it's still never really your ministry. It's His ministry that you oversee. So relax. Enjoy this gift that God's given you, and never take any of the glory for yourself for what God does through this ministry that you're stewarding. Let me tell you a story, another story about a pastor that wanted some credit for themselves. Debbie and I helped this pastor with a new church plant, and a couple of years later, we had a chance to come back to the church, and man, we were impressed with how it would grown, lots of people, nice building, great property, and we told him how excited we were to see what God had done. And he said, well, don't forget that I had something to do with this too. <laughs> Boy, Debbie and I stepped back a couple of paces from him. We didn't want to get struck by lightning. Sure enough, within two years, everything had fallen apart. His wife left him. The people left the church. They lost the building. Look, don't make the mistake this pastor made. His only role in that church was to be obedient to what God told him to do with that church. And then, when he'd been obedient, he still doesn't get any credit. Let's go to Luke 17, verses 7 through 10. Let's see what Jesus said about this. Luke 17, starting in verse 7, Jesus says, Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to the slave when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat. No, but he'll say to him, Prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. And then afterwards, you can eat and drink. He does not give the slave thanks because he did the thing which was commanded, does he? 
so you too, when you do all the things which you are commanded, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. For the slave, the needs of the master take priority. I used to think that this passage was a bit heartless. I mean, why not at least thank the slave when he does a good job? But now I understand this full concept of God's grace. I understand this passage. When God gives us a grace, a free gift, He gives us something that we didn't earn, we didn't deserve it, and He gave us that grace so that we, so that He could get all the glory, all the credit. And why would I, a bondservant, get any kudos for simply doing my job? Remember Paul's attitude on this, 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 17. Paul is a steward whose least is to fulfill his ministry. When you're doing everything that you've been called to do in ministry, that God's given you, then you've done the least. You've only been obedient. You're not a rock star. You're not a hero for being obedient. That ministry is God's grace to you. So that means that God has to get all the credit and we get to take no credit because it was a grace. Get it? Well, let's move on to another grace. Money. Let's talk about God's grace of money. You know, lots of divorces list money. Actually, I think it's most divorces list money as a primary cause for the divorce. The love of money is the root of all evil. And yet, none of us seem to ever have enough money, right? If I'm bought and paid for, if now that I'm God's bondservant, I have nothing of my own, then that means that all money and all assets I have in control don't really belong to me. They belong to God. Most Christians I know would agree with everything I just said. So if it all belongs to God, that means that any money or any assets that I have in my control come to me as a grace from God, a free gift that I didn't earn, right? Well, I know some folks are going to say, well, yeah, but wait a minute. I have a job or I have a business and I work hard at that job. I've earned what I get paid for or I've earned the money from that business. Well, if you weren't a bondservant to Jesus, maybe you could say that, okay? But since you're God's bondservant, the question becomes, how are you supposed to steward God's gift to us of money? Well, let's start with the tithe, the tenth. Tithing is the most important thing you can do with your finances, in my opinion. Turn to Numbers 18, 24 through 26. Start in the Old Testament. Numbers 18, verses 24 through 26. For the tithe, the tenth, of the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to Yahweh, I have given to the Levites for inheritance. Therefore, I've said concerning them, concerning the clergy, they shall have no inheritance among the sons of Israel. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the sons of Israel the tithe, which I have given you for, from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to Yahweh, a tithe of the tithe. The tithe is how God pays his priests. I, I, I can't go into all the, don't have time to go into all the details here today. But essentially it was a brilliant support system for the clergy. The word tithe simply means tenth. And in other places in the, New, in the Old Testament, it explains that each Jew wa, who was not a Levite was expected to give to his local priest a tenth of the increase. For the business people out there, the increase means your net income, your revenue minus your expenses. If I'm paid a wage, then all of that wage is increased. So the people were expected to give a tenth of their increase to their local priest. In return, that priest gave to the temple a tenth of what he received from the people. And if this is done according to God's plan, the priest's annual income 
is exactly the average of his parishioners' incomes. Pretty cool system, right? Well, the time, by the way, is not voluntary. God considered this to be the first 10%, and it belonged to him. Turn to Malachi 3, 8 through 12. Malachi 3, verses 8 through 12. Malachi writes, Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? I say in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says Yahweh. I will test me and see if I will not open up the windows for you of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. God accuses here the people of robbing him. Apparently, the people had stopped giving the tithe to the priests. And God took that not as robbing the poor little priest. No, God took that as robbing him. Why? Because the tithe belongs to God. Notice all the blessings in verses 10 through 12. They're all dependent on people tithing the complete 10%. Verse 9 makes it clear that those who don't tithe bring curses on themselves. Well, I'm going to have to stop here for today. There are several interesting things about stewarding God's grace of money. And we'll finish up this idea of tithing. We'll address the question of is tithing really for the modern church? And then we'll look at offerings and other kinds of money and giving. And so come back next time and let's see what the scripture actually has to say.